say you and I had no language in common, and we only had our bodies to communicate. Some things would be pretty simple, right? Like communicating yes, just nod, no. Um, two years ago, I hired a, a new worker in my construction crew, and I didn't know much about him besides he was 66 years old, he was Albanian, and he knew about four words of English. I would assign tasks to him using uh, Google Translate or made up sign language, and he would just look at me and go, so I would try to find something else, so I would insist, and again, he would say, he would go like this. Um, and then after a while, it just started to stress me out. I, I thought, I, I cannot work with, with this guy. One weekend, I made up my mind that I was gonna talk to him on Monday and tell him I had to fire him. Uh, when we got to work on Monday, all my crew got there at the same time. We just had to uh, start working. We didn't have time to talk. I had to get him busy. I told him what I wanted him to do. And he looks at me and he goes, Yes, Orson. Yes, Orson. See, my worker would learn one word of English every weekend. I guess that weekend he learned the word yes. And also, I didn't know that in Albania, this is yes and this is no. <laughs> now, we've been working together for two years. We're also in a band together. We still don't barely know any words of uh, common language, but we managed to play some complex world fusion music. He's also helped me with my street art projects. And in my band, in my, in my collaborations, in my company, we are all from different countries. Uh, Rwanda, Burundi, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I'm from France. Nobody's perfect. Um, and, and so we spend our days laughing at each other's uh, speech patterns. Sometimes when one of us voices out an idea, and the others think this is something that could only come out of the mind of a Vincentian or a Congolese or, or a Frenchman. And there's also plenty of drama. You see, when you come to a new country and you're without family or support network, often the people you work with become your family. It is said that it is best to keep your personal problems at home, but those lines get blurred. It makes for a strong bond that allows us to be there for each other in times of need. And it also, I also know that on the stage or at the job site, we perform better than any crew I've ever been a part of. Now, you may want to hire immigrants or collaborate with immigrants. If so, then congratulations. Now, let's get to work. Typically, when companies contact me, uh, to ask for advice on working with immigrants is because they already hired somebody and they're having some issues. And usually the issues can be broken down to the fact that the company or the managers did not realize how much of our behavior is cultural. Um, so, for instance, I worked, I had a friend of mine who I hired, he was from Congo, and when we'd work at somebody's house, uh, he would talk to the client and he would say, excuse me, mom, or excuse me, dad. And uh, so it made this for a cringe-worthy moment, nothing too bad, but uh, it took me about two years of a lot of exposure and, uh, to Congolese culture to realize what he had done. First of all, he was, by saying mom or saying dad, he was say, telling the person that he was, the, that person was good enough to be of his own blood. He could be his family. He would respect her or him as he would his parents. And also, he was stressing out the fact they were older. Now, who the hell stresses out the age of an older woman? Well, somebody from a culture where age and experience is extremely respected. When you work with somebody from other cultures, it can threaten your every assumption. Migrants are used to it. The dis this, this discomfort is something that we experience every day. But for, and it's, it's a lot of work, it's exhausting, it's also exhilarating. But for the person who is used to functioning in their own culture, and their culture is the dominant culture, the, the encountering 
of the uh, cultural other can also lead to a lot of fear. That fear is something we're quick to call xenophobia. In Greek, fear of the foreign. But what is xenophobia? What does it mean for us? In the present poli uh, political climate, xenophobe is a word like sexist, like racist, like bigot, that we use to label somebody um, for character assassination, to tarnish their records. In opposition to that, some well-meaning people may have welcome immigrants, bumper stickers on their cars, or write well-thought-out Facebook posts about their outrage at anti-immigration policy. Um, even more than that, some people might willingly join a multicultural space. Um, when I first arrived in Portland, there were so many immigrants, and it's also I encountered a lot of Americans who wanted to get to know their immigrant neighbors. They would say, why aren't the immigrants out in the bars? We never meet them. Well, I'll tell you what happened the first time that I saw uh, a Congolese in a bar. I was there with a female, American female friend of mine. I thought everything was going great. And within a, a few minutes, she comes to me and says, help me, Orson. This guy just keeps invading my personal space. So I wanted to tell her that probably if she also had grown up in, a, in one bedroom with seven siblings, she probably wouldn't have much personal space. But the gist of it is just that personal space, like every, every other behavior, is entirely cultural. Um, so there are many ways of refusing to encounter the, the cultural other that are hidden in welcoming attitudes. You may be comfortable with me coming into your home, or uh, living next door, or even flirting with you. But only because I'm doing all the work or speaking your culture. The minute that I talk about race, sex, religion, the way we perceive them in my culture, the minute that I show my romantic interest in you, the way we do the mating dance in my culture, the minute I forget about your culture's personal space, we have a big problem. The U.S. is full of multicultural spaces. Queens, New York, the most ethnically diverse place on earth. In the widest state in the country, in Maine, Portland, Maine, public school kids, 33% of them speak another language besides English at home. Technically speaking, since I only meet people from my culture once every five or six years, every, culture, every space I enter becomes multicultural. But I know better than to assume it means that I can just express my culture freely. Uh, my social survival depends on my assimilation. The better I assimilate, the less discomfort I cause, the less potential for fear. So really, not being afraid may technically be the opposite of xenophobia, but it also may mean that in the first place, one is not even ready to receive cultural other. Um, when I arrived in Portland, Maine, for the first time in over a decade, I had an incredible community. There were so many immigrants, so many people with whom I shared the experience of migration. And the Francophones often would call me grand, which is big, like older brother. Uh, with that filial name came also a lot of responsibilities. So when my businesses and my, my artwork and my music started picking up, I decided to bring some of these immigrants in my, in my work. Um, and I was hitting one big hurdle, which is that in the American workplace, in American culture, the workplace is somewhere where you're not supposed to be made to feel uncomfortable. Yet, for people who are from other cultures, when you're living in the U.S., you're always uncomfortable. I would see it time and time again. If I had all a crew of entirely immigrants and one single American worker, they would dictate the company culture, shut down dissident voices, and refuse to dialogue. I was told, for instance, by Americans who identified as underprivileged in one way or another, that it was not their job to educate their co-workers, uh, who could barely speak English, um, how to speak to them in a politically correct manner. One even told me, 
If they want to learn, they just have to go on Google. And that's when it kind of dawned on me. That's it. You cannot Google what a 67-year-old Albanian needs. You cannot go on Google and find out what a 22-year-old lesbian from Burkina Faso, staying at the homeless shelter in Portland, needs to feel respected. So the disadvantage of not speaking the cultural language of the US or of the internet precedes all. So I felt the need to create an exclusive space, um, a place just for migrants, in I guess what Americans call a safe space. But what is a safe space for, for migrants? What is a safe space for people who share only one thing in common, and that is to be in culture shock? I guess it would be a safe space that's not comfortable. In that safe space, um, we discuss issues. We confront each other about each other's cultures. We ask pointed questions about Muslim prayer, homosexual practices. We talk about them. We probe. And then day in, day out, we get over it. And we change. My perception of aging, for example, has totally changed in contact with the Congolese and their respect for experience. So we became an intercultural space. An intercultural space is not just multicultural, but it is a space where all cultures get to exchange and learn from one another. I had a female uh, employee from, from uh, Uganda, and she, I was training her in carpentry, and she said, you know, Orson, I'm a, I'm a baby American. I said, don't say that, because I don't like the ways that we infantilize immigrants. She said, no, really. And someday, you come to Uganda with me, and you'll be a baby Ugandan. She had a point. When you go to another culture, decades of experience can become obsolete, and you have to start from scratch. It is very important to know that, when you're, especially when you're working with older workers. For us, with my Albanian worker, for instance, he has to follow my directives all day. I'm 30 years younger than him. I have less experience in carpentry. When, he get, when we play together in a band, he gets on stage. It doesn't matter you don't understand Albanian. You know he's boss. You can tell his years of experience. These moments are incredibly important to create. But also, because someone has to start from scratch, the leader of the intercultural crew has to really take on that role of older brother. And and use the freedom of speech of the intercultural space to educate about the host culture. I had a worker from Angola, and he had been in the country for three years. We drive down to Kennebunk to a job, and we'd be in the car, and one time he tells me, you know, Orson, I'd really like to have a white girlfriend. I said, well, I'm sure you could. And he says, yeah, but they're so expensive. <laughs> so I said, what are you talking about? I mean, I've started relationships with uh, Central African women. And it's not just you pay for dinner, it's how much do you leave after for her to buy shoes the next day. And the second time we get together, we talk about how much money I'm going to send to her family. So I'm like, why do you think that? And he, he says, uh, well, my friends who are dating white American women, the women move in right away. They have to buy them a car. They're always going shopping. And you know how white women love heroin. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Where did your friends find these women? And he looks at me like I'm stupid. And he says, well, on. And he names a street corner in Portland where the prostitutes hang out. <laughs> Operating in a different culture is risky. It can get you arrested, or it could get you punched in the face, like I was shortly after 9-11 by a co-worker who was convinced I was a member of Al-Qaeda. But, and it's also, there's risk involved also for the person hiring, or the leader of the crew. Often I get contractors who tell me, you know, Orson, I, I love what you're doing. I'd like to hire immigrants too. I say, yeah, great, I got this brother from Uruguay, uh, he just got his work permit. They say, well, how is his English? I'm like, not great, he's been here for a year. And they say, well, I don't think that's going to work out. So in, in this uh, host culture, 
there is a lot of insistence on words. People are so proud to call themselves perhaps Republican or so upset to be called racist. But there's sometimes a lack of action. There, for, for me, there is a responsibility to share discomfort and to share risk if you wish to support your immigrant neighbor. For many people who are here, many migrants, simply embarking on the journey to make it here is incredibly risky and dangerous. As we speak, you know, coming to this um, multicultural space, people are dying to share with us. It's not a metaphor. As we speak, perhaps, in the deserts of Mexico running out of water, in, on a raft in the Mediterranean, or in the overheated engine room of a cargo ship headed to Brazil, people may be losing their lives to share this space with us. We may meet here on safe soil, and they may respectfully call me uh, older brother or papa, but it is them that I admire, and they are my masters of bravery. Uh, me, you see, I have not just one, but two of what I think of as the greatest privilege in this 21st century. I have two first world citizenships. Because of that, I'm here today able to talk to you. I hope that everything I've said today honors those who cannot speak. I believe we have a duty to match the level of discomfort and risk to get over our fears. You may think there's nothing you can do, but don't be discouraged. You can be there. You can be that person for an immigrant, that person they can go to with any question about this culture. And with, when talking together, things start getting a little uncomfortable, that's great. You have just entered that space beyond xenophobia. Thank you.